Can you see my screen? Yes, please. Okay, so let's start the presentation. So I'm going to introduce you Apache Airflow. So let's start. The agenda is the argument that we are going to see uh, what is Airflow and why using Airflow. Uh, the next is uh, the basic concept to best understand uh, Airflow, then the Airflow structure, the deployment. Then we go more deep into the basic concept, the DAG and the tasks. Then we see the operator, the user interface, and last, some code examples. So let's start. What is Airflow? Airflow is an open source workflow orchestration platform uh, developed by uh, Apache. So, but fun fact, uh, it uh, was initially developed by uh, Airbnb and uh, now it's managed by Apache and it's open source. So Airflow allows users to monitor, schedule and manage uh, workflow using the Python scripts. Uh, so, and has also a web-based user interface for visualization and monitoring this workflow. But why we have to choose Airflow and why not? So basically, Airflow is a workflow orchestration pattern, but it's not designed for uh, not coding. So it's designed for coding. So the most basic things you want to do in Airflow, you have to write some Python code. So if you are a clicky guy that you like, like most uh, using interfaces uh, instead of coding, Airflow is not the right choice for you. But Airflow is also designed for uh, workflows that doesn't have any cycle inside them. So in this case, if you are uh, if you are able to code in Python and if, if your workflow does not have any cycle inside it, you can use Airflow. Otherwise, the Airflow, Airflow is not the right choice for you. So let's start uh, to see the basic concept. Airflow is a workflow orchestration platform. In Airflow, a workflow is called DAG. That stays for direct acyclic graph and represent the workflow itself. As we can see in the image on the right, we have the JAG1 and we have four tasks inside it. A task is the individual units of work and a task represents an action, for example, sending an email, collecting data, uh, an action. So in the image, uh, in the JAG1 in the image, we have four tasks, DAG task one, A, B, C, a D. Oh, sorry, I did a mistake here, but this uh, should be a D because it's a different task. So A, B, C, D. Uh, and this uh, workflow does not have heavy cycles. So this is allowed in a flow. Uh, the DAG2 instead, from task D return to task A, this is not allowed. So uh, DAGs and tasks uh, are very Excuse simple. Excuse me, you can minimize the panel so that it doesn't obstruct the view. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, as you can see, DAG2 have a cycle, so this is not allowed. DAGs and tasks are very uh, easy to understand concept. So this is these are the basic concept of Airflow. Let's move on to see what this means in a practical example. So we have a JAG, a workflow example here. So as you can see, in this case, is a single Python file. We have a few imports from, from Airflow libraries, and we can simply define a JAG that is a function in Python by uh, decorate our function with the, the at DAG decorator. So uh, inside the decorator, we can specify some metadata like the uh, DAG D, in this case is the hello world DAG, the start date, the schedule interval. There are a lot of metadata, but you can check uh, based on your needs in the documentation, all the metadata. Uh, this is the most used one. These are the most used ones. So uh, 
uh, and then we can define our function that represents our jug, so our workflow. Inside, we can specify a task using another decorator, the add task decorator, and then we can define our function that performs the action. In this case, simply print hello world. And this will produce a graph output like this. Hello world that with one single task called hello task. So uh, it's really uh, a simple in practical example. Let's move on. Let's see the outflow structure. So to uh, have an instance of, sorry, of airflow running, we have to know what are the required components and what are the optional components. So the required ones are the scheduler, the web server, and a metadata DB. So the scheduler handles the triggering schedules, workflow, submitting tasks to the executor, and uh, run tasks its, itself. Then we have a web server that presents the user interface. Uh, and then we have a metadata DB that collects all the information about tasks and DAGs. Then we have the optional component. We have the optional worker that executes tasks given it by the scheduler. In the basic installation, this component, the uh, optional worker is uh, uh, inside the scheduler, but you can separate if you want. Uh, then we have an optional triggerer, we, which executes deferred tasks in a CTO event loop, but in a, a basic installation, we, we don't have this component. So we are not going to use this component. And then we have a DAC processor that parts your files, your Python files, and store all the metadata about uh, the files in the metadata DB. Uh, so this is the op these are the optional components. We can deploy Airflow on our servers in different methods. So this is uh, this is the simpler one. So the simplest one. Uh, as you can see in the image above, we have uh, one user that manage all the installation, the writing of workflows, and then we have only two Python processes that one is the scheduler that included the parsing, the scheduling, and executing the files. And then we have another Python process that is the web server that presents the UE to the user. And then we have the metadata database, but uh, is uh, uh, with, you can deploy this architecture in only one server. So you have a single machine managing all the stuff you need to run uh, Airflow in this case. And this is the simplest architecture that you can use uh, with Airflow. But we have a more complex ones. I uh, put this architecture only for example because it goes beyond the, the scope of the lecture. But as you can see, different architectures introduce different roles. For example, we have a deployment manager that installs all the components. We have a JAG router, and then we have an operational user that is different from the JAG router and the deployment uh, uh, manager. So in this case, we can also spread all the component inside the scheduler to different machines, different servers, and have a very complex architecture distributed. So uh, there are different ways to install Airflow. We are, can use the source code, PyPy using the Docker images, uh, third-party managed service, in this case, I'm going to go for the production Docker image. You can download the image from the link that you can see and simply choose the components you need. In my case, I only choose the three required components, the scheduler, the, uh, the metadata database, and the web server. So I installed uh, work Airflow in a single machine in my local computer. So let's go more deep into the basic concept of the airflow. So that stands for direct acyclic graph and 
is the core concept of behavior flow representing our workflow. So DAX is about collecting tasks together, organize the dependencies between tasks and the relationship between them. So the DAG itself doesn't care about what is happening inside a task. It's only about how to execute them, how to schedule them, the timing, and, and so on. So I flow loads DAGs from the Python source file, uh, which uh, look inside the configured DAG folder that you, for example, configure uh, from inside the Docker Compose if you are using Docker. So this means that you can have uh, multiple files with different DAGs, or you can have one, sing one single files with different DAGs, but you can have a very complex uh, uh, DAG or workflow uh, spread over different Python files. You have basically the powerful of Python for creating your DAG and workflow. Every time we run a DAG inside Airflow, uh, we create a DAG run instance. Airflow creates a DAG run instance that is an object representing the instantiation of the DAG in time. So uh, the DAG is created and the tasks are executed. And the status of the DAG depends uh, on, the, on the task states. So uh, if you execute, uh, so the DAG run, uh, as I said, uh, is an object to representing an instantiation of the DAG in time. And every time you run a DAG, uh, a new process start running the DAG run. So this means that you can have multiple DAG run of the same workflow or of the same DAG. Uh, so you can have uh, multiple DAG of the same, multiple DAG runs of the same DAG running uh, at the same time. So the status of the DAG depends from the task states, but there are many possible different states for the DAG run. We have running, hold, fail, success, up for a try, et cetera, et cetera. You can check all these states basing on your need. You don't have to remember all of this stuff, but the most important one are failing and success because at the end of the execution of all the tasks inside the DAG, the DAG can have only one of these two different states, fail and success. Uh, so let's move on. To trigger a DAG, we have different uh, ways. We have uh, the user interface. So by accessing the user interface, as you can see in the image below, you can uh, click the play button under actions and start manually a DAG. Or you can use the, the REST API that provides Airflow that allows you to start the execution by sending an HTTP request, for example. You can use uh, time-based scheduling, so you can specify an interval such every day, every hour, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you can use the command line interface to trigger your DAG. Now let's go more deep into tasks. Tasks is the base unit of execution and they are arranged into that as we saw uh, as we saw before so uh, DAGs have dependencies between them so for example uh, th there is an order in which we want to execute tasks so they have dependencies they depend from each other and there are three basic kinds of tasks we have the operator that are simple the predefined task templates that you can uh, use to build most part of your DAG because with few line of code, you can make a complex action. For example, you have the operator to send an email. So you simply have to import the operator inside your DAG file and use. We have sensor, a special subclass of operator, but uh, that is about waiting for an external event to happen, but 
uh, we will not see into more deep this type of task into this lecture. And then we have the task flow decorated task that is a simply a custom Python function packaged up as a task. So you write a function, you decorate with the at task decorator, and that function became a task. So the task, uh, uh, a specific task, will run only when uh, all of its parents are executed correctly. By default, this is important, tasks don't pass information to each other because they run independently. This means that uh, iFlow creates uh, a process for each task. So create a process for a DAG, a run instance, and then inside the, the DAG is execute the various tasks and create a new process for each task. So uh, they, by default, cannot communicate. Uh, but if you want to pass information from one task to another, we have a mechanism called if comes that is uh, a way to pass information between uh, processes, in this case, between our tasks. Uh, and we will see later how it works. So how we can specify the dependencies uh, inside our DAG file between tasks, we have the pitch shift operator, as you can see here, that specify the order between tasks. So in this case, I have task one, and then only after the task one is completed and with the status success, we go to task two. There are many possible states for a task instance. And we can see here we have none. The task has not uh, yet been queued for execution, scheduled, queued, running, success, etc. Uh, in this case, uh, obviously, you don't have to remember all these states, but you go check the states, the status you need based on your needs on your task status. Let's see the task life cycle here. When a task starts, has the status none, then pass to the status scheduler, then goes inside the executor that queued the task, then inside the worker that runs the task, and then if the task is completed successfully, is marked as success. So ideally, this straight line should be the ideal path that a task should execute. So, but we, for example, can have some errors. So in this case, during running, we can have some errors and we can uh, have this path here. So by specifying the metadata inside the task decorator, we can specify the uh, retry policy, for example. So we, is this task eligible for retry, true, false, how many times, et cetera, et cetera. So, we can have all these possible paths for a, a task. But ideally, the task should go from none to scheduled, queued, running, and then success. So as we saw before, our operators is a special instance of a task. It's a predefined template for tasks that you can just define in the declarative way. So, uh, iFlow itself has a very extensive set of operators available, but you can check all these operators by going to the documentation or by Googling it. So before doing something, you must check if there is an operator available for this. For example, here we have a bash operator, an HTTP operator, an email operator, and you can use it inside your code uh, as you can see in the image uh, below. So for example, I define, I uh, cut in, in, uh, in the image, but I have to import my operator. So I import the HTTP operator, I import the email operator, and then inside my DAG, I define the HTTP operator that sends an HTTP request to this URL here. And then I defined an email operator that sends an email to 
admin at example.com with this subject. But the scope, the, the, the purpose of this demonstration is to show you how easy it is to uh, use operators and to do complex action. And then we specify the dependencies between tasks. As you can see, in this case, we don't specify the, we don't decorate the function with the, the at task decorator because high flows uh, knows that they are tasks. So you don't need to decorate the, the function if you are using the operators. This file here will produce an output graph like this one that you can see called my dad with two tasks ping if the ping goes well then email so and these are the operators and we have a lot of operators a lot of useful operators so for example we have the bash operator to execute bash command python operator to execute python function but this is uh, the old method to execute custom python function but because uh, as we saw before, now we have the decorator, the X task decorator that help us to execute custom Python function. We have dummy operator, email operator, HTTP, MySQL. And for example, here we have also the Docker operator that can be very useful. And you don't have to write any code to use it. So for at least a few lines of code. So they are very useful. And then we have uh, a friendly user interface uh, that help us to manage our workflow. So the user interface is only to check the state, the status of a DAG to trigger a DAG, but we cannot basically uh, create DAG from the user interface because as I said, I said before is uh, Airflow to do with Airflow to do the most basic thing, you have to write some Python code. So the user interface is only for checking uh, the status and so on. For example, uh, if I, uh, as you can see, we have a DAG list here. We have our DAG runs. So the instance of all the DAG that runs and we can check the, the state. We have the recent tasks with their states, and then we have some buttons here that we can click to trigger a DAG or to delete a DAG. So for example, by clicking on the DAG run, the DAG runs, you can inspect all the uh, instances. So you go into this user interface here that lists all the DAG runs with their state, uh, for example, by clicking one single DAG run, you can go through this interface that lets you see the graph, uh, the output graph of the DAG. Here you have uh, other, useful, other useful views, and then you have the task states, and you can see that the border reflects the status of the task. But we will see uh, in, a, in a practical example. So let's see uh, some code example. I have uh, here a running instance of Airflow. Can you see? Yes, okay. Uh, so here I have these six DAG. So let's inspect them. So for example, if I click here, I have this interface that show me a summary of the DAG. We have this DAG with these three DAG runs, the time and the task. In this case, this DAG has one single task it's called hello task. We uh, have a lot of metadata that we can read here, and we have all these useful interfaces. But the most important one are the graph, where, where you can inspect all your uh, path between the tasks and the states of the tasks. And we have the, uh, 
we have the code here. So here we can inspect the code. So for example, this is the uh, hello world of the DAG. So for example, we have uh, an object defining the, the arguments. Then we have a DAG when with the DAG ID, we pass the arguments that we defined before. We have a description and we have a scheduled interval. Then in this case, it's none, but because we can trigger this DAG, we want to trigger this DAG manually, only manually. And then we, are, we have our DAG function. Uh, we have a simply function that in this case is an operator. And as you can see, I have input this operator here. So is an operator, bash operator that lets us to execute bash command. In this case, my bash command is a simply echo hello world. So this will print hello world. So let's see if it works. So for example, if I can, if I click here, I can run, I can trigger my DAG. So now it's in a running status and we can see the task status that running now is completed and now the task status is success. And also we have another DAG, another DAG runs instance that is in the success status. This is it. Let's check it out. And for example, by clicking the task, you can also check the log, the XCOM that makes task communicate. Let's check the log to see if our task works correctly. That is our task print hello world. So let's see some other examples. Dependencies. So this, let's inspect the code. We have three tasks here and they are simple tasks decorated with the, the add task function that simply print task when executed, the task to execute, the task pre executed. And this is uh, only for showing you how to set the dependencies between tasks. As I said before, you can use the bit shift right operator to set the order of execution between tasks. In this case, we have task one, then task two, then task three. And this is very important because we want to respect the order of the task. So this will produce an output like this. And we can also check the log of our tasks. And for example, I can run the task. Now, now this is good. Okay. And they run correctly. And we can check the log, for example, by doing this. Okay, task you executed and they work correctly. Let's check now this one called parallel. Basically, it's the same as the previous one. We have three tasks, but we didn't specify any dependency here. So what uh, Hyflow does in this case, let's check the graph. Here, we have this graph here. In this case, if you uh, don't specify any dependencies between tasks, they are executed co concurrently in parallel, but the, the, the order is not guaranteed here. So they run in parallel at the same time. So let's see an XCOM usage example now that XCOM, remember you, is uh, the mechanism that lets you, that lets you communicate between tasks because they by default run into separate processes though, so they cannot communicate by default. So in this case, we have two functions. Uh, we have the push function that returned an hello world string and we have a pulse function that gets a value and print the value to the screen. So in this case, we can simply uh, coding like normally, so declaring a function and then running the function and then passing the return value to the next one. But it's XCOM that is doing his job under the hood. So I'm showing you this because this is the most common case, but 
If you want, you can check the documentation and create more complex scenarios between tasks and add some rules, for example. Let's check the branching. This is a graph like this. This is a complex, and as you can see, only one part is executing depending on the condition. Let's, let's inspect the code. In this case, uh, we have our DAG defined here with the at DAG operator, and then we have run this first that is an empty operator that does nothing, basically it's uh, a marker, you can say. And then we have an options array uh, where we define our branch names. So here we have a task decorated with the at task dot branch decorator that let us to return a string representing the ID of the branch that we want to follow. So in this case, we are choosing a random uh, branch from this array here. And then we can execute our, our, uh, our function, our task, and we can uh, set the dependencies. So we run the first empty operator and then we run the random choice. Now we can define other tasks. So as you can see here, I'm defining dynamically uh, a, a set of tasks in a for loop by using this array. So by looping the array, we are defining a task with the D, the current option, so task branch A, branch B, branch C, branch D, and we create uh, an empty operator. So we can uh, chain all our tasks also dynamically, for example, in a for loop, as you can see here. So, and we have this chain, this task, this DAG here will produce an output like this one. So, the path is followed, uh, is based on the random choice that we have here. That returns the name of the branch that we want to execute. And then we give this name here uh, as ID to our first task following the branch. Uh, now we see uh, an example of an external configuration because if you need, you can pass external configuration to a task. You have to simply put a value in input inside the function uh, where you define your DAG and then pass the value to the task itself. Uh, here is uh, also running XCOM, XCOMs behind the hood and Hardflow manage all the uh, hard work for you, but it's really easy to do this. So you can pass external parameters like this. And for example, if I want to run this DAG passing external parameters, I can do like this. I can trigger a DAG and I can pass an external configuration. Here I have my message and I can write here a very cool message, for example. And then I can trigger the DAG. Now it's running. Okay, completed. And let's see, let's inspect the task that brings our method. And then here we have a very cool method. So in this way, you can pass an external configuration. And that's all. Uh, uh, if you have uh, any question, uh, I'm here to answer and thank you for your attention. Thank you for explaining that. I was wondering whether you can give us a flavor of the type of project that you have uh, used uh, uh, yes. Airflow yes. for. Yes, for example, I actually use uh, this uh, type of workflows for collecting uh, 
for collecting data. So I have, for example, a folder inside the web server where some third party partners can upload files. Then I can, uh, I have a script, a Python script that check the changes on this folder here and sends an API request to trigger a DAG every time a file is uploaded. Then I have, for example, three tasks, one task that, uh, that makes the pre-processing of this file, one task uh, that uploads all the files, and one task that notifies me about the correct uh, or uploading or if some errors happen. So it's basically uh, every, uh, you can run on a flow, every workflows that has a start, a defining start and a defined ending. So you can separate your, logically, you can separate your operation and run inside Airflow. The advantage of doing this is that Airflow manages manages for you all the metadata about tasks. You can schedule your task, uh, you can trigger by API, and you can check the status uh, of the task by accessing the user interface and uh, all these advantages here. Okay, thank you. And can are you also able to, to time out uh, tasks so that it doesn't yeah. uh, wait forever for- uh... Yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of, uh, so Airflow is able to do this by itself, but you can specify inside the, the metadata uh, or when you define your task, the running time, for example, the maximum running time on the maximum attempt for retrying and all this uh, type of information here. There are a lot of information that you can specify on the metadata. I just show you the most basic ones. Sure, of course, of course. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one question from my side. I assume that here you made the introduction of the airflow because you are using it together with Kubernetes. Um, so actually, um, there are a bunch of orchestration engines. So may I ask? Um, why why do you choose Airflow and um, such as the, there are also some other orchestration engines available? They are also quite um, similar, providing similar features and APIs like interfaces. Um, yes, yes, yes. So I basically choose Airflow because it's open source. It's very well documented. So if you go inside the documentation, you can find the uh, all the instructions, very well instructions, very well done instructions for doing anything. And also has a very huge community. So you can find a lot of operators for doing stuff. You don't have to write your own code. In most, uh, most of the times you can find an operator that someone uh, that has done for you. So, there are uh, alternatives, uh, but uh, I use Airflow for these reasons here. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. If I can add something uh, following uh, the answer of Mirko, uh, when you should choose uh, a a, a, an application uh, uh, one of the the first things uh, we look is uh, if it is uh, an open source but as Mirko said it should be well documented because there are a lot of application but not documented and uh, uh, I suggest also to use uh, those applications uh, that uh, have a community around no? uh, being an open source uh, application application, uh, the, the, those applications uh, uh, should support by an open community. And this is important when you start uh, phasing with uh, a, a new application uh, and uh, you need to start from scratch. You need support, you need, uh, of course, uh, documentation. Exactly. Thank you, Antonio. 
Uh, thank you very much, Antonio. Are there any other questions? Uh, I have a question regarding uh, the relation between uh, um, Airflow and Kubernetes, because both of them support uh, kind of uh, distributed computing. So what's the difference and how they work together if they, if they do? Uh, I actually, uh, I am not uh, an expert about Kubernetes, so... <laughs> uh, so maybe, maybe. So the, the Kubernetes uh, uh, and Lorenzo, I don't know if Lorenzo is here, can uh, uh, correct me. Uh, the yeah. Kubernetes uh, works uh, on, the, uh, on the distributing uh, and the balancing of resources. Right. And uh, one of uh, the, uh, uh, the application that we can deploy in, uh, within a Kubernetes, within a worker, for example, the, the Docker, we can, uh, uh, it could be a, a DAG, a, a Nightflow uh, instance. So we yeah. can put inside a container an, a, 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 a Nightflow DAGs and run the, through the Kubernetes. Yes, so this is by, possible. Yes, by using the Kubernetes facilities. But uh, why do we need to, to have distribution within one worker? Uh, and you can do it in different ways. For example, you can you do it with those nodes as well. Or do you have any better control of the GPU processing capabilities? Uh, why should why is it better to use Airflow? Because uh, they are, uh, there are, uh, uh, make like so you cannot for example if you separate the worker uh, you cannot the worker cannot directly access the dag file to read them but it's the scheduler that parts and can read the file so you have more security in this case uh, by using the, the, the distributed airflow architecture for example so you have different roles for the users and you have you can implement more uh, in a, all the ecosystem in a more secure way. So uh, the worker cannot directly access the files, but only the scheduler, and the scheduler is managed by a specific person, the worker by another person. So uh, these are the main uh, question about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Airflow does make full use of the GPU card capabilities. Uh, I mm, can assume that uh, using Python, you can use the GPU features, but uh, I'm... Mm, I but, think that uh, this part is more demanded to Kubernetes, the yes, distribution I, of the GPUs, the CPU, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's, that's the, the, the difference, no? It, the Q Kubernetes is uh, uh, more uh, uh, on top of the, re the physical resource and distributed ones, and the Python and sorry, and the iFlow is more related to the uh, the code execution. Yes, but for example, um, Airflow use Python, so uh, ninety nine percent of the power of Python you can use in Airflow. So. Uh, I, I think that you can manage your GPU inside uh, Python using uh, Airflow, but how to manage all the systems, uh, then uh, here is a Kubernetes for issue. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? If there are no other questions, then I would like to thank you very much, and then we thank continue you. in uh, something like Three quarters of an hour from now. Uh, no, no, just a moment. Let me have a look at. Yes, at two uh, Central European time, free for Greek, no? So uh, we can start again at uh, o'clock at Central European time. Right? At two, so no? It's, Central European yeah, time. Two. Central European time, yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank okay. You. Have a See nice you. Time.